In one of the previous videos, we introduced not just the condescending face of Leonard Euler, but also Euler's phi function, which for any positive integer n simply counts how many positive integers there are less than n, which are co-prime with n. And remember that we said numbers x and n, positive integers x and n, were co-prime if their greatest common divisor was 1. That was, there were no numbers, no integers larger than 1, which divided into both x and n. And then we used that to establish Euler's theorem, which said that if I had two uh, positive integers, a and n, which were co-prime, then a to the power phi n was equivalent to 1 mod n. So a to the phi n would leave a remainder of 1 when divided by n. Now, what this actually also gives us is a quick way of working out multiplicative inverses in modular arithmetic. So how does Euler's theorem give us this quick method for multiplicative inverses? Well, we know that for co-prime a and n, we have that a to the phi n is equivalent to 1 mod n. So if instead of writing a to the phi n, we write it as a times a to the phi n minus 1, and that's still equivalent to 1 mod n. So if I try to unmultiply both sides by this a, get rid of this leading a, then I get to the fact that a to the power of phi n minus 1 is equivalent to a to the minus 1 mod n. So I can work out what the multiplicative inverse a inverse is by working out a to the phi n minus 1 mod n. Now in the previous video where we did um, affine ciphers, we did the repeated multiplication and we showed that mod 26, the inverse of multiplication by 7, was multiplication by 15 and we'll see that um, on the next slide. What we established in the previous video was that, well, I wrote down the integers 0 to 25, multiplied each of them by 7, and then worked out the remainder of 7 times that integer, mod 26. And we saw that by the time we got to 7 times 15, I got up to um, 105, and the remainder of 105, when divided by 26, was 1. So I would say that 7 times 15 was equivalent to multiplication by 1 mod 26. But I could get the same result directly from Euler's theorem. And that would come from the fact that because 26 is the product of two primes, 2 and 13, I can multiply phi of 2 by phi of 13. And for prime, I had a prime p. I had p minus 1 as phi of p. So I would have 2 minus 1 times 13 minus 1 is 12. So what that would tell me is that 7 to the power of 12 minus 1, or 7 to the 11th power, mod 26 would give me the multiplic multiplicative inverse of 7 in this mod 26 arithmetic. Now that's not super tidy to figure out itself. We might need to use the uh, methods for calculating large powers in modular arithmetic by repeated squaring. But 7 to the 11 mod 26 is 15 and that's exactly what I got from the table.
There is a famous theorem, which is now often thought of as little more than a corollary of Euler's theorem. And this is Fermat's little theorem. It says that if I've got a prime number p and another integer a, which is co-prime with p, then a to the power p minus 1 is equivalent to 1 mod p. So, for example, 100 to the power 16 is equivalent to 1 mod 17. 17 is prime, 100 is co-prime with 17, so that would hold. And that just follows trivially from Euler's theorem. So I pick any prime p, then I know that uh, phi of p is p minus 1. So just putting that result in, and I instantly get Fermat's little theorem. So this is named after Pierre de Fermat. Just an aside on Pierre de Fermat, as well as the little theorem, there's probably the much better known Fermat's last theorem. You probably know for Pythagoras' theorem that for a right angle triangle, the length of one side squared is equal to the sum of the lengths of the other two sides squared. So you can find relationships like three squared plus four squared is five squared. Well, Fermat's last Fermat's last theorem says that there will never be any three integers a, b and c such that a to the n is equal to b to the n plus c to the n for any integer values of n larger than two. So obviously you can get these to the first power, Pythagoras, we can get these to the second power, but it established that this was not possible for cubes, fourth powers, fifth powers, or indeed any other powers. And around 1637, he made this claim, along with the statement, I have discovered a truly marvellous proof of this, which this margin is too narrow to contain. It should be noted, though, although this is called his last theorem, it was the last to be proven. But in fact, it probably predates Fermat's little theorem, the earliest written record of which is about three years after. Fermat's apparently last theorem. Now the reason that Fermat's last theorem holds the place in mathematics that it does is because it actually remained unproven for over 350 years despite his claim that he had a simple proof that he just didn't have room to write down. And it spawned an amazing interest both within the mathematical community and further afield, um, including the Simpsons jokingly claiming to find a counterexample. But it was actually eventually proven to be correct uh, with the proof published by Andrew Wiles in 1995. Um, a man so distinguished that Oxford University has named its new mathematics building after him. <laughs>